Hey everybody, it's Kevin Rucha here with Digital Marketing Fastly. Today I have a very special guest. Today I have Shauna Armitage. Hey Shauna, how are you doing today? Good, how are you doing Kevin? Good, good. Super excited to have you on here. I love having other marketing people on the podcast. Of course, this is a marketing podcast. You have a podcast yourself. Love for you to introduce yourself, your company, and you know, talk a little bit about your podcast as well while we're here. So I'm Shauna Armitage. I'm the host of the Startup Renegades podcast. I speak to startup founders about their story, how they came up with their idea, the entrepreneurial journey, and then ultimately what strategies they use to scale. Because when I'm working with early stage startups as a fractional marketing director, that's always the thing. Is it social media? Is it paid ads? Is it content marketing? Everyone wants to know what's that one thing that's going to grow their business. Exactly. Okay, perfect. And Shauna, Love for you to maybe talk to us a little about your background. How did you get started into marketing? Was it when you went to school or, you know, did you have your own startup before? Oh man, we don't have enough time to do that, Kevin. I had initially gone to school to be a teacher and then failed my teacher tests and okay. went back a couple years later for professional writing. So I have got a degree in history, which is completely useless. And then my degree in professional writing. And I started taking writing jobs for marketing agencies and then realized that this marketing thing was so much bigger than what I was doing. I really liked the strategy. I kind of got involved with the different companies. And a few years in, I started working for a friend of mine. At first, it was great. Ended up not going well because we weren't seeing eye to eye on how to deliver for the customers. So he fired me. And it was the best thing that could have happened because I started my own work. I remember my husband saying to me, is anyone actually going to pay you for this? Yeah. You're not an agency. And I was like, damn, I don't know, but I'm, I'm going to try. And it turns out they will pay me for this. I found that there's kind of this gap for startups, especially if they're bootstrapped, between hiring someone full time or hiring a bunch of freelancers because a lot of founders don't know what they need, yep. right? Is it that content piece? Is it that ads piece? So I work as the fractional marketing director to build the holistic strategy for the brand. And that's not something that seems to be happening a lot for startups right now. I think it's like a lot of startup founders don't really know what they're looking for. And sometimes hiring a freelancer is great, but a freelancer kind of wants you to tell them what to do. Where someone like yourself, fractional CMO, if you come in and really help them out, it's something that I'm seeing too, at least for us as an agency, we don't really do kind of the stuff that you would do. We would probably work with someone like right. yourself to come in and implement some of the stuff. And it's something that we're seeing too, because even for us, we work with startups and they want us to be their full marketing department. I'm just, I'm here to do ads for you. For us, it's like we fight this sort of internal battle. Of, we know we need to do it because if there's no strategy and plan or place, we, our results suck. And then it's like, well, like we need to charge more. So it's, it's very interesting because now we are doing like mini roadmaps where we say, hey, look, this is kind of the strategy and mm -hmm. does it align with you? We're kind of like their CMO, but like not really. And it's like a weird thing because it's like for yourself, it's probably better because you're going to say, hey, look, I'm here to take over. And, and you know, too, when that relationship is like that, you, they believe you versus, hey, we're just giving you advice. And it's, nah, I don't want your advice. You know, when you hire somebody to be like, <laughs> CMO, this is what, exactly what I'm looking for. Something that you just said really stands out to me because but what I do doesn't work if they don't have roadmap, if they don't have their funnels, right? If the other part of their marketing isn't in place. And that's where a lot of marketing gets a bad name. Like you've all, you've heard it like, oh, I paid a lot of money for marketing before and it didn't work and this, that, and the other thing. Well, if you're just kind of guessing at what you yeah. think that you need for marketing, but it's not really going to fit into your overall strategy or your overall goals. It's on the marketer's fault that, yeah. that you didn't get results. It's because you went into it, not really understanding what you needed in the long run. For me, I think about it as a vision. What do you think? What do you, what should it be? And the vision of founders these days, it's sort of what they hear online. It's kind of like, hey, you should be making money the first month. Any business, that's not really how it works. And anything, you start something, it's kind of crazy that that's like the mindset of people are going into right now. How are you guys as an agency? How are you guys like, you're supposed to make me money. If I could predict your return on results, I wouldn't be working for you. I'd be doing my own companies. I'd be selling any widget I could potentially think. We have a process, we have a system, we've seen stuff work. Let's see, can it work for yourself? And again, yeah. as a founder, you need to be also be doing the work. I tell people all the time, it's not 100% us and then you not doing anything. You need to actually be doing a lot of work too. So how do you think about, let's say a new startup comes to you. What would you plan for them? How would you think about strategy? Would it be Facebook, Google? Is that Facebook, Google something that 
you think about right now with the new changes or would it be more traditional stuff like email marketing outreach? So the first thing that I need to understand is their goals, right? Because everybody's going to have different goals, different time frame to achieve those goals, but also their budget, their resources. It's great to say, you know, we're going to go straight into Google or we're going to go straight into Facebook. But if you yep. have little to no budget, then that's not realistic. And we have to find another way around. But assuming that they've got the branding basics, right? Their, their website's on point, their opt-in looks good, their funnel's all set up. I'm probably going to go straight to brand awareness and lead generation because I need to get people into that funnel. Certainly there's lots of ways to do it. And one thing I will say, you know, because you brought it up, I do not suggest Google ads to any of my clients. I work with startups. I don't work with businesses that are going for any kind of local, specifically local traffic. And it's just too expensive. When we're talking about bootstrapping budgets, a lot of times the problem that a startup has is either their market is so saturated or what they do is so unique that nobody's searching for it. It's not something that's really relevant. We need to do something that's more disruptive. So I will go to like Instagram and Facebook ads to start. If the product's so unique, that's sort of when you need a little bit more of this brand awareness slash lead gen versus obviously someone sells like t-shirt you're never gonna compete on google of course the demand is there but it's so yeah. expensive on google ads it's almost impossible and my background is like computer science and then we did a lot of program stuff that's why you saw a lot of software as marketing where you give away a free tool and then that's sort of like a lead gen into your b2b stuff because you can't compete with salesforce for example you look yeah. for crm you know salesforce is bidding up because they're the beast in the company so a company like hubspot which is another crm when they first started out, content marketing came out. Even now, they have a tons of tons of free tools just to get business owners to go into their ecosystem of free stuff. And HubSpot is a great example of this incumbent that came out of nowhere. And I mean, they're like a $20 billion company now, but they're still sort of innovating with this type of mindset. And, and I think business owners and founders, that's kind of what I'm seeing you need to be do sometimes because paid ads, even Facebook sometimes now, it's so expensive. You know, five yeah. years ago, it's so cheap. You're probably breaking even on the front end. And if you don't have another product to sell, or if you think that like, this is going to be a one-year company, like, you're going to for a long run. Like I've done e-commerce too. I'm not making money until like eight months in and I'm like stressed out. This sucks. No, you even mentioned about like the changes on Facebook. Like things used to be really cheap and now they're really expensive. First of all, it's a supply and demand problem because not everybody was using Facebook ads a couple of years ago. People were still going much other routes. They were doing the Google ads. They were doing local flyers. They, you know, they were doing a lot of different things. Now, everybody is using Facebook ads. So the bidding works differently because you're competing with a lot of other people for that spot for somebody's attention. But now we're talking about the iOS changes and that is just completely changing the game. And yeah. it's one reason why I used to run all the ads for my clients and now I have someone on my team to manage it yeah. because it's a full-time job to keep up with those changes, to make sure that you're doing it effectively. You can't just simply manage ads anymore. Not if you want to see results. It's too hard to manage everything yourself. It's very interesting. I think I've seen this happen before. You're like a one person team and two people team. Keeping up with all the changes is very tough. And even with Facebook, the constant changes, iOS 14 destroyed everybody's results. You have to verify domain. You have to set up these events. You have to set up all this like technical stuff that nobody knew conversion API. You have to like right. wait 24 hours to make any random changes. It's just crazy. Facebook is... It's still a great platform, I think. I mean, I, going back on the Facebook changes, I actually just did a video on this. I don't know. This is my thoughts. The Facebook users are still there. It's just that Facebook yeah. doesn't know how to find those people. Facebook's going to somehow buy all this data and be like, all right, I know who you guys are again because maybe a few months ago, there was like the delete Facebook movement or delete Instagram movement. People actually left the platform. Facebook just doesn't know who you are. But I'm thinking like these people are still there. Again, going back to Google, this is why Google is still so great because you're still searching for the stuff. So you're still getting qualified traffic. Before Facebook, people were still selling online. They were still advertising. None of this like demographic targeting. So, but at the same time, the products that people had before were truly value added items. Where right now, you've probably seen Sean, the past two years, people sell like something from Alibaba, add a logo on it. Hey, a brand new product. There's nothing new about this. You're just making it slightly cheaper. <laughs> That's why I like being startups. <laughs> yeah. Those startup days, e-commerce days, I think are over where... It was just going to arbitrage and there was no true value added on kind of like an iPhone, for example, that's an innovative product or startups that raise money. Those are innovative products that actually need marketing because, you know, it's a very, it's not like a me too product, essentially. I think with that too, that we have to remember we were spoiled with 
the early days of Facebook. In terms of marketing strategy or anything else, it's not that old. The people who were the first to use it were truly innovative and they didn't have a lot of competition in the space. Now everyone has competition. It's just like any other marketing platform. What happened five years ago, it's not gonna work for you today. You know, people talk about Instagram strategies. I remember probably five or six years ago now, this guy that I was working with was like 18 months, he grew his account to almost 30,000. Yeah. And he was like, I just, I post six to eight times a day. That's yeah. it. Like there's no science to it. You could never do that now. No. It's just not how the algorithm works. Yeah. Right now, it's it's all about reels. It's all about putting up that kind of content. You have to keep on top of this stuff. Whatever we, we got used to working just doesn't work anymore. What you're saying is a great point for, for people listening or business owners listening. It's what happened a year ago is just basically doesn't work anymore. And I know for a fact people are searching for what should my Facebook row as be? People ask me that literally almost every day when I'm having calls. I don't know. Like, okay, what are you getting across the account? It doesn't matter because for your brand, it's different. As business owners, they want to know an answer. I'm making it up. But if you want to hear a number, I'll say four. So that will make you happy. Those tactics don't work anymore. Let's talk about what are some new tactics that you're seeing working right now? I'm thinking if you're not on TikTok, at least, you know, you should be on there to think about it. And the reason why I like this platform is similar to what we said before, rewarding you to post organic content. It's giving you views. It's giving you free traffic. So I would say if you're a business owner, try to get on these platforms that are up and coming because they haven't been like similar to Facebook and Instagram where the, your likes or your followers see everything you post. And that's great where right now, if you have a thousand fans on Facebook, maybe one person sees it. And that hasn't happened to TikTok yet. That's why people are quote unquote are going viral. So go on these platforms. And that's something I to tell business owners to do. We don't do any organic stuff, but I say, hey, you should probably be thinking about this organic stuff for your brand because we're seeing success from other friends and entrepreneurs that we're talking to. I'm going to be honest. I'm still not on TikTok. I'm probably like the lone marketer that's yeah. not on TikTok. Clubhouse. It. It's just like, it's so entertaining. <laughs> it's crazy how you follow some topic and it's like, literally, I can understand why it's addicted. I go on there. It's always stuff I want to see. Everybody says that. And I have friends that like repost it to Facebook or yeah. Instagram, which I love, but I'm not that entertaining. Like, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. I'm a strategy person. I'm just going to go in there and talk about building your email list. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not there yet. For me, it's not anything revolutionary. I think when I talk to people about strategy, it's more about the mindset about how you're, you know, how you're putting strategy together versus one platform or the other. I think it's really important for us to understand with what worked with certain platforms five years ago doesn't work now. Also kind of the mindset that worked then doesn't work now. People now, especially since since COVID hit and everybody's stuck at home, we're shopping for convenience and we're shopping for connection. There are people who hate Amazon, buy on Amazon because it's easy and it's going to ship straight to your house in two days and yep. they sell everything under the sun. But people are going to spend two or three times the amount on a very similar, if not the same product from a brand that they feel connected with. And that's the difference. There's so many choices out there in the world of e-commerce online that people aren't just buying what they find on the grocery store shelf or in Macy's. You can uh, explore Instagram and you can and you can find new brands. People are ultimately purchasing from brands that they feel share their values at the end of the day. That is something that we're seeing too. A lot of brands nowadays are kind of value-based and organic beliefs. I think it's something that we're seeing a lot more, which is very interesting to see. And I think it's because people have a little bit more money now versus before. Mm -hmm. People are just earning more. Uh, but again, too, it's also just a different type of different type of person you're targeting. Because again, if you still live somewhere else, you know, you still want value play and companies like Walmart are always going to be strong. Like the Kirkland brand I was reading recently is like maybe like a $15 billion brand. That's just Costco's generic brand of product, which is ridiculous because Costco makes so much money. If you have like a new startup, it's really about the values you bring and sort of like, I tell people all the time too, it's connecting with yourself, the founders. I think a lot of founder driven businesses are doing really well yeah. now where the founders actually out there, at least 10 years ago, like, you didn't really know the founders of companies, but even now you start realizing that if your founders out there yourself, you're really connected. Even for like, I mean, the biggest one is Tesla, right? Everyone's like, oh, Elon's car. It's like, even though Elon probably doesn't work on it and he has thousands of employees, they just know anything goes wrong or right. It's, hey, Elon has a good car. Elon has a good car. Because he's the founder of the company. Right. He's so local. But the employees are there, like, hey, I'm the one that made the car. No one knows them. So it's very interesting how you're seeing that now. And it's resonating with a tons of tons of companies. I mean, think about Coca-Cola, all of the brands. You don't really know who they are. And the founders are 
or CEOs forever just working where new companies are very founder driven now. And at least for me in the SaaS world, that's also how it is where, you know, the founder yeah. of a software company, that means you're going to try the software because you're like, Hey, he's a pretty smart guy. I believe that he can code something up. That's would be very helpful. I love it. It's so true because I feel like it was almost like not professional, you know, you've got this professional page where it's the college that you went to and then maybe for long walks on the beach or some nonsense. But at the end of the day, it's like all this professional stuff. And now people really care about who the founders are as a human. Nobody cares where you went to college. They care what you've accomplished. And if the company is sustainably focused or eco-conscious or women-led or person of color-led, that's what people care about. They want to see themselves, their values reflected in the, uh, excuse me, reflected in the businesses where they're spending their money. I tell for a long time too, like, this is what you need to do. And even for me, I'm doing a podcast, I'm on interviews. I wasn't somebody that was always great talking to people, but it's something that I knew that the industry was doing and I had to be there or else like, no, we'll know, at least for marketing. Marketing is literally just being there and somehow someone will find you. That's helped me grow my business. And it's something I tell people all the time, like I had a coach for two years. I went to public speaking classes for two years just because I knew this was something that I had to do in order to grow my company. Yeah. You have to do those sacrifices like anything in life. It's if you want to be someplace or somewhere, you have to do the hard stuff and it's never going to be easy for anybody. And people will say, oh, you're so great on camera. I'm like, oh no, I actually went to, I actually studied for this because I had to, because I, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> right? I remember making my first podcast, my first video. I was like, oh my God, I was like so weird on there. Now I just talk around random stuff. <laughs> you're just telling me I have to suck it up and get on TikTok. That's what you're trying to say, right? No, no, no just go, you know, we get like a TikTok coach, you know? Another question I have for you, when you're working with businesses or owners, what are some mistakes you see that they're making right now or something that you see go in and it's like, a, okay, cool. I, I've seen this before. Let me go and fix it because this is a very common mistake people are making. A very common mistake that people make, especially like on the website, mm -hmm. it's telling people what they think they need to hear instead of what the customer actually wants to hear. It's like they've never talked to their own customer before. You know, they don't understand their voice, not talking about what's actually important to the customer. It's like what they want to be important to the customer and not having an opt-in clearly above the fold. So many businesses, it blows my mind still, the UX is just garbage where you've got to click three different times to get pricing or to fill out a form. People should be able to give their email to you really quickly and easily. That's how you get them into the funnel. That's how you continue the conversation because point blank, it's almost never going to happen where somebody purchases from you the first time around. So that contact information is essential. So you're saying it's so important. I worked with founders that going back to what they said, they see themselves as the customer when technically they might not be. So then they're designing the websites around what they feel would never sign up for an email pop-up. So I'm not going to do that to my website. I'm just oh, that's the that's, worst. I'm like, that's not how that works. I Sorry. I cringe so hard yeah. right there. Cause I hear that too. They're like, I hate it. So I don't want to do it. And I was like, well, then you're probably not going to get any leads yeah. and it's going to be a long time before you make any money. I'm sorry. And, and I literally say that too. Oh God. It's one of these kinds of people. <laughs> I kid you not. Someone told me I don't want to add subscription to my website because I would never do a subscription. Wait, what? I'm assuming you pay for Netflix, you pay for Amazon Prime. Somehow in your mind, it's different. But I call these people kind of the first time doing a business where they are making the most beautiful site, one line text of like the copywriting is like one line. And then they realize in a few months or years that they've made no money. Yeah, you see like Joe Schmo over there with like that website you thought was really dirty and not looking. He's actually a millionaire because he's actually getting sales. And yeah. he knows that the copywriting, adding all this content and giving the users the information they want is what's going to make you buy and get the conversion rate. Trust me, I tell people all the time, no one's going to click around your website and look at every single tab that you have. This page that you're driving traffic to through paid organic, make sure it really gives them everything they need. Obviously, Amazon's a little different. I say Amazon pages or product pages are really cluttered. They're reviews, images, videos, FAQs any random question that you can potentially have because they want to convert. Amazon pages haven't been designed in so long because they know that yeah, like, why, why, why would we? It's converting, right? You probably seen like new companies, the website's so clean, the designs are flying off the window. I'm just like, I literally have no clue why the checkout, it's like vertical. I have to click <laughs> hard. I get the design is cool, but it's not friendly to check out. So I don't know. That's problematic. Exactly what you just said. The founders, essentially a lot of times they are their first customer, right? Because they're trying to solve a pain point that they themselves experience. But once you really get into it, 
you have to be willing not just to talk to the actual customers, but to pivot when necessary and not get in your own way. I don't want to do that because th there's having values, right? Like there's being making conscious decisions around your values, but just saying, mm, I don't like that particular marketing strategy, so we're just not going to do it is not a viable reason not to engage in a strategy because an expert who actually knows what they're doing is like, this is what you need to do to actually generate revenue. And what I think too, it's not getting your own way, but it's also at least giving it a shot. I'd say like, you want to at least experiment and just say, let me just try it and see what happens. It's very easy to say no. It's harder to say yes. And just say like, let's give a small budget. Let's see what works. And that's kind of, at least for us, you probably do this too, where we tell clients like, Hey, let's just give it a try. If it doesn't work great, you were right. If not, then whatever, let's move on. And at least we give it a shot because then you're not guessing. And then, you know, it's, it's not something like that. So that's the way we, we think about it. It's very similar for me. You know, that a founder is likely going to fail when they're not willing to test things, right. When they're not willing to, even like you said, even just a small budget, you know, but you're not going to get it right on the first try. You have to test things to figure out what works and what doesn't. So you, you can continually be optimizing and making things better. And that's the path to scalable growth, really. And that reminded me of when people hire people such as yourself, myself, I tell people all the time, they want results in like the first month. I don't know if I can get you something good in the first month because I'm going to be testing though. This is our, this is our strategy. Yeah. This is how we're going to do. I tell people it's the same thing as like, let's say you hire somebody full time. Are you going to fire the person after one month? Maybe not. They're just trying to do their job. And again, same thing to us. What if you guys aren't like here to like make me money? We're like anybody, like any human in the world. We want to do a good job. I tell people all the time, do you think it feels good when we don't do a good job? Why isn't this campaign working? Why is this thing not converting? It affects yeah. us. It's not like I just go to sleep like, Oh yeah, I just don't want to, I don't want clients to be happy. Sometimes clients think that I actually care. Like, I want to make sure you make money because you make money. I make more money. That's how the world works. Yes. I want to make sure your shit is working. That means I can make more money. I can hire more people. I can bring on, get better. And again, give you learnings and make sure that you're happy. So that's the way I think about it. But Shauna, I had a question for you with the brands that you're working with. Are you guys really doing anything like, at least nowadays, I'm getting this question a lot. I'm not sure if you are influencer marketing. Is that something that people are still doing for a brand new startups or is it something that you're maybe more established companies should be doing? So I'll say, yes, it is something that people are doing, but it's really, really hard to do. Right. Especially a lot of startups don't really have a budget. So influencers, all the prices are wildly different. What you get is wildly different. And the issue that I come across is someone's like, yeah, well, you can pay me X amount of money for a post, two stories, and there's no actual relationship between the influencer and the brand. They're going to post maybe a couple times one day, it's going to be gone in 24 hours, or it's going to be pushed past the nine grid, and then you never, you never see it again. And unless you've got someone who's got killer engagement and a real connection with their audience... It doesn't do anything for brands. So it's like this catch 22 of like really wanting the brand awareness, but trying to understand where to put your money, where it's going to be effective. A lot of the companies that I'm working with right now, we're going for more strategic partnerships. So people that may not have huge audiences, but have good engagement, good communities and have synergy. So they're not in direct competition with us, but they are selling to the same audience as us. So we build campaigns together. Uh, we do cross promotions for each other and it's slower grow, but we're seeing it to be a lot more effective than a lot of the relationships that we've had with influencers in the past. The way I think about influencers, a lot of people just don't have the budget for it. Mm -hmm. And then again, a lot of influencers, like the 1 million, 2 million influencers just doesn't drive ROI for most brands. It's really for brand awareness mm -hmm. play. And the way we do it here is I want influencers that are kind of smaller, similar to what you said, and that could potentially have a better community. But the way I like to do it is I like to get them to make us content for our paid social. And then we will yeah. run traffic behind that because I just want the influencer for the person, the way they're acting, the way they look, the way they can control what they look with the product. That's what I want. And then promote on our end. I don't want you to post because I know I'm not going to get any sales from you. Give me the content because I want that. That content is really valuable. And I do have influencers that I work with where we... We take all the content, they just send me all the videos and, and all of the posts afterwards, and then we use that for things, which is great. But in terms of actually getting sales, people signing up for the email list or whatever it is, those strategic brand partnerships have been much more successful for the companies that I've worked with. All right, Shauna, where can people go to find you, hire you for any startups or a company looking to bring someone yourself? Where can they go to maybe get on a call with you and say like, hey, come work with me? 
Yeah, you can go to shaunaarmitage.com and that's where you can find my form to sign up for a call, chat about your startup, what you've got going on. And at startuprenegades.com is where you can go to listen to some of the just amazing founders. I work with some great other amazing founders and hear their, their startup stories. And then again, too, for people listening, Shauna, you also have a Facebook group as well where you can you know join if you're on Facebook. And again, I think on your website, you have some free resources where we can get some plans or even email you there. And if you go to shamaarmitrage.com, guys, here's a free discovery call, 25 minutes. You can learn more about what strategy will work well for your business. Shauna, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate your time. Anything else? Let me know. No, that's it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a great day. And thanks for listening to today's podcast.